Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Hello and welcome from us. The capital has been a vote-free zone. No elections here this week, but plenty to think about. On the margins of the city in particular after the local election results, especially in Essex where Labour lost the little it had and UKIP failed to trouble the scoreboard, which is why we're pleased uh, to help us understand what next for the party uh, to have with us here Peter Whittle, uh, Deputy Leader and one of the two members of the London Assembly currently. Hello. And opposite him, reflecting on the potential impact on himself and others from what we saw this week, John Cruddus, a Labour candidate for Dagenham and Raynham. And for the Conservatives from out west of London, we have Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, who's been representing Spellthorne up until this point. Welcome um, to you all. Um, John Cruddus, let's start with you. Is there a serious danger here that London's long dominance of the capital is now under threat? They yeah, there is. There is. I mean, we'll have to see how it plays out. We have a, a month to go. I think there's going to be an awful lot of variety at local level, dependent on incumbency, local campaigns, issues around planning. There'll be a lot of tactical voting. Um, I think there'll be a massive youth registration as well over the next month in the city, which means that, I mean, it's very easy to predict cases on what happened over the last couple of days, but I think it's going to be a much more mixed picture and there's all to play for. But how do we get to this, in short, in essence, how did we get to this in, in terms of your party? Well, these things don't fall out of the sky. These have been developing or at times festering for the last 12 years and they'll be played out over the next month. But I think, I, I would say, look, this is an election campaign now. People will focus in on the last couple of weeks. Um, the manifesto process will come next week, I think. Um, there's an awful lot to play for. A lot of people will zone in on this and register and get involved. An awful lot of young people will get involved, I think. An awful lot of tactical voting at local level. So I think let's not rule anything out of this state. But when you heard, for instance, what someone like uh, the defeated candidate in Birmingham talked mm. about uh, not strongly representing enough sort of key Labour issues, was this exactly how you feel? Well, it's been a long-term argument of mine that Labour has detached itself from its traditional working-class communities and constituencies for a long time. Um, but we'll see over the next week how that plays out. Again, I say this didn't fall out of the sky, but I'm very optimistic that things can change over the next month and everything to play for, especially given the strength of the Mayor in London, local Labour MPs in London, some of the candidates. We've always shown a real resilience and a very strong ground game. Peter Whittle, um, mm. uh, how, how can it not be over? Oh, it's far from over. I mean, you know, if I had, you know, a pound for every time someone has got me on one of these shows and said, you know, that's it for you, Kim, I, I, I'd be very rich, uh, and I'm not. Um, I think the thing is, is uh, what happened this time, yes, it was bad, you know, the, the local election results were bad, no point in putting a gloss on it in that way, but at the same time it worked for us, extremely unusual circumstances. What did happen is a lot of Tory vote, a lot of UKIP voters did go and vote Tory. Um, a lot of the uh, UKIP voters are very much sort of, if you like, uh, you know, country before party. There's nothing wrong in that. What will happen though is that we're only halfway through this and we have been low before and we will come back when it, it becomes apparent that the Prime Minister is backsliding, is not really going for a proper Brexit, people are not getting what they voted okay, for. Does, this mean, does, it, does this mean that you, just, you won't stand in a lot of London 73 constituencies? Oh no, I think we're pretty much covered actually in London. Are I mean, you I, how many are you going to stand in? I, I'm not completely certain of the number, I, I'm sorry, but um, I think we're, we're pretty well covered actually all over the country. I mean it's not, you know, there are only a few seats where, for example, there have been really kind of, you know, avid Brexiteers that we, we, where we won't stand So you'll go for the majority of the seats in London, you'll put those deposits forward and you have no fear that your, that your votes aren't just going to be wiped out no, because in a month? No, because people have to have uh, our name on the ballot to vote for it. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. And, I mean, I've always been a great believer in that. It's just a few constituencies, I'm talking nationally now, where, in fact, we won't put somebody up. But I think the main point is, is that, look, We've still got 350 councillors. People th are thinking we're sort of wiped out all across the country. Plus, we've just gone up uh, a point in the opinion polls today. Now, what's that about? Well, um, quasi in, in a moment, but actually, because it directly relates to, obviously, your seat and a number of others out there, if, if the UKIP go and implode again and their vote disappears in a month's time, and goes, which is we have been seeing everywhere in the country, goes to the Conservative, you will lose a seat, won't you? Maybe. 
I mean, look, in 2010, the Tories were very confident on the day that they knocked me out. It was a key marginal. 2015, the UKIP thought they'd won the seat. It's always but very now lively. It here now, it's always we very lively in my seat. Um, I think, actually, the results of the last couple of days has shown us that in more traditional working class seats in sort of Sandwells or Tees Valley, there is a more resilient UKIP than uh, in some of the sort of Cambridges or the Shires. And I think that will play out over the next couple of days. Cosy, Cosy, Let me just bring Cosy in here because sure, we haven't spoken you. to him as you watch and listen and very I don't know what you Enjoy, enjoy. Very interesting debate. How, how can you lose? Well, I think I think I agree with John in the sense that uh, four weeks is a long time. The very volatile election, lots of things going on. I think uh, the prime minister struck the right note when she said that she wasn't taking anything for granted. Every vote will count. And I think obviously there is a huge contrast between the strong and stable uh, Theresa May that people are picking up on, and a completely chaotic opposition. So how can you lose? Um, I think the way that we could lose is by being complacent is by taking people for granted. But I think uh, what we are seeing from UKIP is a pretty desperate situation where they lost, I think, 146 councillors, something like that. Yeah, we dealt with that. They gained before. one. Um, and, but this is a real problem. Well, I mean, where, you can't where, just where, do you, where do you think, just as we sit here now, uh, and what we've seen in terms of the locals and we've seen the focus on Brexit, but what are the policy winners going to be for the Conservatives? I think we've got a good uh, offer um, on lots of things. We've got a particularly good offer on uh, housing. I think we want, we've got a plan to build uh, more houses. I think we've got a very good uh, policy uh, on the economy, just general economic stability, getting a good Brexit deal. You can't just brush That's off. Like you've read our running you order. Just, you can't just brush off Brexit. <laughs> Both the I mean, subjects. It's a key. Okay. Both and, the subjects um, we're going to be dealing with now. And, so some... I mean, I'm particularly interested in extending grammar schools. I think that's a really good policy, which I hope... That was one of you, our schools. The, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's a good idea, and we're going to push it. Not forward. something we've got particularly in London. In fact, we're not dealing with that um, uh, today, but let's um, move on. Uh, London is a city of the rich and poor, and in some places, granted, fewer and fewer of them, they live side by side. Take the constituency of Westminster North. It's a seat which could be hit by the UKIP effect we've just been describing, but it's also a good place to assess the party's record on and plans to address inequality. Andrew Cryan reports from there. Westminster North might have a claim to being the most polarised seat in Britain, home to some of the richest people in the whole world, but also real deprivation. Politically too, it's split down the middle. But one side has had the upper hand. Now, this doesn't look an awful lot like what most people would think of as a classic Labour constituency. But for the last two decades, that's when it's been home to the Labour MP, Karen Buck. Conservatives, though, have had their eyes on it. It's been a top Tory target in all of the last general elections. Hello, how are you? This is the Labour machine in action at three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. So you, you, you'll be voting, voting Labour on June? Everything on Labour. They're hoping to upset the Conservatives once again. And they really expected to win in 2010, um, and locally uh, they, were, you know, they had their tails up in 2015 uh, as well. And I can only uh, put it down to, uh, you know, to, to hopefully the work that I've done o over the years. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. A catalogue of casework and a local reputation. That is the message here reflected in the leaflets going through the doors. The thing that strikes me mm. is it says, you know, re-elect Karen yep. Buck, says Karen Buck. What about the party leader? Well, as I have said to you, this, as far as I'm concerned, this campaign is 650 individual elections, and we are going to be you know, campaigning on, on that basis, on the, in the, you know, the, local, uh, the local area, and I am standing as the local MP, and I'm standing uh, and, and campaigning on my record. Lindsay Hall! Lindsay Hall! But in this polarised seat, the Conservative candidate Lindsay Hall is fighting an almost opposite campaign, where she's keen to talk about Jeremy Corbyn wherever possible. We've had um, a very strong local incumbent, Karen Buck, for 20 years, and she's hard to tip out, but I'm going to do it this time. OK, what's going to make the difference this time? Well, there's a few factors here. One of them is, of course, um, I am now equally as well known locally. I've served on Westminster Council for 10 years. And, of course, we have the Corbyn factor. And that changes everything, because at the end of the day, this election is a choice, a clear choice, between Theresa May, strong and stable leadership, or a coalition of chaos led by Jeremy Corbyn. And for anyone wondering who to vote for, Karen Buck or Lindsay Hall, well, if you want Jeremy Corbyn, vote for Karen Buck. <laughs> The Lib Dems are also standing in this heavily Hello. Remain constituency, hoping their anti-Brexit message will cut through. <laughs> We're the only party offering a second referendum. We believe that Brexit is a process that began with democracy and should end with democracy. 
UKIP are not contesting the seat, but the Greens are. Their candidate, Emmanuel Tandy, is a solicitor. We asked for an interview, but she wasn't available. But in this seat of great contrasts and completely different campaigns, it's very difficult to predict who will be the new MP on the morning of June the 9th. And Kwasi Kwarteng, I mean Westminster by name, but in that constituency, I think the ward, I think it used to be the poorest ward in the country. I mean, maybe there are four or five out east which are, which are poorer. What are, what are the Conservatives going to be offering for the huge cohort of people who are, have very low incomes, poor living conditions, etc.? I think the worst thing for people on low incomes is to have a very unstable and weak government. And I think Lindsay Hall put it very well when she said it's a contrast. It's a very sharp and stark contrast between Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn. And certainly in my constituency, and I suspect in John's constituency as well, Corbyn's lack of leadership, his chaotic, uh, almost nonsensical pro uh, proposition, is brought up again what, and what again. What are your policies again. that are going to counter um, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour policies, which will be focused on helping you know, the lower pay to the people who are less well off? I think the government has a good record on this. I mean, if you look at something like the personal allowance, when I came into Parliament in 2010, uh, that allowance was something like £6,000. We've almost doubled it. It's 11,500. You have to learn, earn more than 11,500 uh, before you start paying tax. And that's a huge uh, achievement to take that many people on low incomes uh, out of the tax bracket, and that's something that we have done uh, in government, and we've got a good record on that. Well, I will ask you about um, uh, Labour's uh, proposal uh, revealed today, but let's ask John about that first as well. Uh, <coughs> but there will be a, an increase in income tax for people over 80,000. Do you welcome that? Mm. Yeah, I do. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see the details when the manifestos come out. But you welcome um, the principle of, 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 of asking for more uh, from people on 80,000? Yes, I do. How because much I would you be prepared Well, I, I don't up? know. I don't know the details that John McDonald's well, going to come out with, but in principle, I accept that, like that we're going to see. He's consulting lots of people like you, so what would you be prepared to see? Again? Well, I don't know precisely the, the thresholds here, but I would say I think in principle I accept that those who earn a bit more should contribute a bit more in terms of reforming and rebuilding our public services. And I think, I think we can win that argument if we make it in those terms. I saw John McDonnell on the Marsh show this morning. I thought he, was very, he put a very compelling case about why we should ask those people to contribute modestly more in terms of rebuilding our public and services. Would, would modest be a couple of pence? Uh, I don't know what precisely the proposal is going to be. I think we'll have to wait. We're sort of in this pre-announcement in terms of our manifestos sure. at the moment, so we're all a bit behind yeah, the eight we ball. In, we're all going with one arm behind but, the back. But I, would, I think well, he's setting out the principle. It's a principle I fully support. Do you, do you accept that clearly it's a tax rise that will have a disproportionate effect on London and could be uh, very damaging to your support in parts of London, not least half of that constituency? Well, I'm not Westminster. sure, because I think it was very much a tale of two cities we saw in your film there. Um, Westminster North is a perfect example with extraordinary wealth. Um, versus people who are really struggling in terms of the cost of living, transport costs, the housing costs, which are exponentially rising all the time. So we need to help those people by supporting them and not putting any, levying any national insurance or tax increases on those below 80,000. That is the other half of this. But is, is 80,000 a, a, a large salary, is a large amount? Does it help you be able to get a house anywhere in central London, for instance? Well, in my constituency, there are very few people who own more than 80,000. So, you know, let's think about the whole of this city and across the outer east end of the city, there are very few people who own that amount. So, you know, I think it is proportionate and I think it will tap into a nerve over the next month. Peter Whittle, do you agree that actually a lot of your supporters will say, God, yeah, I think people on 80,000 should pay a bit more. Not really. I think it's the, it's, the, it's the wrong way round. I mean, I think that the, these sort of things are, in a way, not really addressing the problem for Labour, and particularly in constituencies like yours, when it comes to housing and things. Essentially, what most people would say, uh, certainly people who vote for us, is, look, you know, when it comes to, say, like, housing... We'll talk about housing in a minute. Yeah. I'll tell you, but let me ask you about the principle of taxation, though. Let's understand. Yeah. Would, you put it, no, would you put it up? For no, no, no. I mean, I just don't think that is... This goes back to... This is the sort of 1970s kind of approach, where sure. basically you start to sort of tax, in a way, sort of success. You, it, you've used an example there, and London is increasingly a place where you can't use examples, actually, because you've got this extraordinary kind of global mm. class of people who have no sort of... Uh, okay. They don't care about tax well, What whatever. we have seen here, quite yeah. clearly, we can see, well, we, there will be more put on there. We know the Liberal Democrats are saying they would put a, a penny on, again, for the National Health Service. Mm. So we want to now be clear from the Conservatives, don't we, about what Conservatives are prepared to do or raise to put more into public services. I'm sure you'll see plenty in our manifesto to get your teeth stuck well, in. One of those tax... <coughs> a, a rise in one of those well, tax areas. V well, VAT's been ruled out by the pre That's BN right. last week. Uh, income tax, would you be, be prepared to see income tax go up? I don't think the Conservatives up? are coming, going to government to raise taxes. That's not what 
we're about as a party. What's very interesting about uh, the Labour approach is that they are going back to a 1970s approach. I remember 1992, I wasn't old enough to vote, but I do remember that Labour had a, a similar policy. They said that people earning over 40,000 would have to pay, uh, pay more tax, and that was a disaster for them. How will in you improve public the, services? Like, was, how, will you, how will you give the schools the money they them. need and the hospitals the money they need? It was a disaster for them in the context of London and the South East, and it's important that we get that across because I think many people across marginals, I'm going to go to Ealing uh, Central uh, this afternoon, many people in those marginals will be very surprised and very upset to hear that Labour thinks that people on £80,000 in this capital and are, and, are and the super and rich and because and they're and not. And a killer to initiative and incentive. No, I don't see it at all. And I don't think people will see it that way, actually. I think it's an argument we are going to be prepared to have. Of those over 80,000 oh. will have modest con contributions. But it is a reworking of your policy in 92. I remember no, no, that. No, no, no. 40,000 is very different to 80,000. Well, well, it was 25 years ago. No, no. This is a, years it's a very ago. modest way of refinancing our public services, which are desperately needing more money. Okay, but let's, some, let's move on to another area. It's the politics of envy, in a way. Let's move on to another area. Peter will like this area. We'll be moving on to housing now. Has something fundamental shifted in the housing debate? So remote as the prospect of owning a home become for so many in the capital that the political narrative has altered and even the Conservatives, the party of property, the mother of right to buy, are having to change their tune. Dan Friedman can explain more. For decades, owning your own home was a political sacred cow. Its appeal cemented with the Thatcher government's right to buy scheme. Mr and Mrs Parker applied to buy the house. But when the government launched their housing white paper earlier this year, they did it while admitting that the housing market was broken. At the same time, figures were released that showed for the first time in decades, the number of private renters outstripped the number of mortgage holders in London. So what we're seeing from the political parties is a concerted effort to court renters as much as homeowners. Renters need to be taken seriously, particularly in London. Homeowners are now a minority in the capital because unaffordable house prices have meant that so many more people are renting. And they desperately need uh, politicians from all parties to offer them some meaningful change going into the election. More than twice as much council housing being built. I want a Labour government that builds council housing. Party manifestos are yet to be finalised, but the Conservatives are likely to stick with the key planks of the housing white paper, which pledges a quarter of a million homes built each year, a lifetime ISA for first-time buyers, a ban on letting agent fees and a clampdown on rogue landlords. Last year, 30,000 homes built in London. That's half the rate that we need to build up. They are beginning to suggest that there is a bigger role for the rented sector and that there's more to be done by local authorities. All that's to be welcomed. Whether it's ambitious enough for the target, I think one has to call into question. Labour, meanwhile, are offering a similar pledge to build a million homes, but they also say half of them will be council houses. They've promised a dedicated housing ministry and want to introduce a landlord licensing scheme. I don't think we'll ever see uh, London totally turning its back on home ownership. What we've got from the Labour Party is quite a sort of a few headline figures so far. Now, it's unfair to say that's all we're going to get because we've still got the manifesto, but you know, it's quite an easy pledge to make. We'll build this many homes and half of them will be council housing without saying how you're going to pay for it or where they're going to go. I asked the other main parties for their take on housing. Renters need, frankly, rent controls. When you're trying to save up to buy one of these ludicrously expensive houses, you can't be paying out more than half your salary in rent. We should not uh, build on the green belt. We should build on brownfield sites when we're going to build something, and there's enough brownfield land around uh, to build a significant amount of housing. The Lib Dems have pledged to build 300,000 homes a year across the country, but also we've got to tackle the private rented sector. One in four Londoners rent privately. So, your house, whether you own or rent it, is likely to have a policy, perhaps with a politician attached, coming your way soon. Um, Peter, I think uh, uh, alone among the main parties, you don't actually believe it's a question of numbers or just necessarily building anymore. Oh, no, no, we've, we've reached a low in, in house building, that is for sure. No one would doubt that. I think that, the, and also we believe strongly in council housing. We want to see a golden age of council housing. Uh, I think it, it is the only, one of the only ways forward. What I would say, though, 
Tim, is this, is that, you know, when I went through the mayoral campaign last year and now going through the general election campaign, uh, the fact is that no one will really talk about the elephant in the room here, and that is that even if you built, like we saw in the film, 60,000 new homes every year, right, in London, it would never be enough to deal with the sheer volume of people who are, that are coming in. To say that you only talk about supply and not demand is crazy, but that is actually what we're doing at the Let moment. Let me ask the man next door to you, to sure. is that the problem really, actually, with the, the housing crisis? Has it been there have been too many people coming from elsewhere? I, I think it's an issue, and I, think, I don't think that Eesh. it's often uh, raised enough. Um, clearly, demand is a huge factor in terms of driving up house prices. And Do we if expect a, things to get better, actually, then after Brexit? Well, I hope that we have more control over who comes in and the numbers. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I stood twice on a manifesto which pledged tens of thousands, um, and I hope to get that back. That is it, which will thousands. have a knock-on effect, do you think, on housing, in, uh, in terms of the pressures of housing, or at least I, the pressure on I them. do not think it is insane. In fact, it's absolutely reasonable to suggest that one of the factors r driving up pr house prices is demand and people coming into the country. That, I mean, that seems obvious. But, it, but the thing Very is, briefly. That, yeah, it is treated as though it's somehow insane. But the fact is, is that London's <coughs> population is going up by a million a decade. To say that that has nothing to do with the housing crisis is actually Before insane. we get on to Labour's plans for building, etc., then we have to tackle that then, do we? That's the key issue, is the pressure that's coming from people coming from elsewhere. Well, obviously. I mean, if, if, it's, if it's surging into the city... It places huge presses on public services, including housing. That's self-evident, yes. Well, that's what it's but doing. It's actually it's doing it's out in your part of the yeah. Oh, it is. Um, but there's, there, there's a number of different elements to this. I'll give you an example. In South Havering, the constituency I represent, the Tory council planned to build 30,000 houses, and literally concrete over vast try, tracts. Try and, we'll try and keep it broad. You know, the rules are yeah. not going too um, focused on that. Um, what about the... Uh, what do you anticipate, or how do you anticipate providing more council housing are you going to be allowing local authorities and councils to, to borrow again and, yeah, and it looks to build like it. completely? It looks really? like it, yes. Really? It does look like it, even though, as, as I say, we are in this period when we've yet to see the manifesto. But if you're saying like a million homes in five years, half of which I think some of the assumptions were would be council housing, that has huge implications in terms of freeing up councils to build. And I'm and a massive supporter But you're welcoming, that, obviously, you know, the, the implications that has for the like, balance sheet it and does, overall borrowing. It does. It and we've, I mean, I, I've this been involved in Labour Party policymaking for an awful long time, and that was always the elephant in the room. We were never prepared to foot in government and outside of it, never fully prepared to grasp that one. It looks like we're going to grasp that now, and I welcome it. And that's but, but, um, and it's sensible, because that is borrowing for investment. You can't argue with this one now, can you? Well, no, no. We know Margaret Thatcher did, but <coughs> new times. No, no. I mean, the facts of economics don't change. If we don't have the money, we've got to find it. And you either do it through raising taxes, which you're prepared to do on uh, fat cats that you, you describe and you think that anyone over £80,000 is fair game on that, and you will have to borrow considerable amounts of money. And this as is where, Mr. Hammond has this, said this as well, is where so Labour gets into the, the familiar problems. They uh, have unfunded uh, tax uh, uh, spending plans, and they never get the money. I, to I'm cover told those. not one social housing, a social house was built. Social housing, as in typically old council house, last year. Is that where you want to mm. be? We know we've got affordable rents and all that mm. kind of. Is that where you want to be? I hate to sort of play and the Labour, you know, to play sort of not devil's advocate, but to suggest that Labour government between 97 and 2010, that was the lowest. Uh, form of uh, social housing investment, the lowest form of housing uh, startups and build uh, that we'd ever seen. And that's part of the problem that we have now. We've, we're playing catch up. The government acknowledges that. And that's why we're saying that we're going to have to build a quarter of a million new homes a year. Okay to catch up from the deficit that Labour left. May well be challenged. We could get into definitions yeah. of whether those were council houses or housing association or whether there was investment in, in putting those houses or bringing them back into use. But to all um, three of you who run out of time, Thank sorry you. about that. Thank you. Andrew. I've been again.